Welcome to Better Worlds Ocean, where we dive into discussions on cutting-edge technology, data-driven solutions, and groundbreaking innovations aimed at tackling oceanic challenges. Join us as we ride the quest of a new era in global sustainability and work together to preserve our oceans for generations to come. Welcome back to Better Worlds Ocean podcast series, where we're talking to people who are working on insights, innovations, and data around the next generation of ocean conservation and working with people all around the world to take things with the ocean into the next generation of work that we need to transform our oceans and our planet. Today, we're joined by Vita Wade at, with Aqua Montserrat and the founder of Fish and Fins. She's calling us today from Montserrat. And Vita, welcome. Thank you, Kate. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you. So thanks for inviting me. Thanks so much for joining. It's really a thrill to get to, to talk to you. And can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, you, you're in Montserrat, which is a, a small volcanic island surrounded by the ocean. So the ocean is part of your everyday life. But what is part of the reason that you were inspired to start Fish and Fins and your broader journey into ocean conservation as a life? Yeah, um, good question. What inspired me? Gosh, there's so many, so many things. But um, Montserrat is a very precious place. Um, and I'm probably biased because this is where I was born and raised. And my family have been um, for generations. But one could describe it as the way the Caribbean has always been. And yet, despite its huge amount of biodiversity and beauty, and yes, we're surrounded by oceans, so many children here don't know how to swim. I went to the primary school in Montserrat when I was raised as a child, being really interested in marine biology and biology in general, being interested in reading our textbooks and seeing coral reefs, um, seeing turtles and all this you know, incredible marine life. But I didn't know how to swim. My parents weren't able wow. to afford me to do swimming lessons or to go um, diving or anything like this. Um, I, I didn't really touch snorkels until, um, you know, I had returned back to Montserrat after, you know, the Montserrat, the volcano re um, erupted. So, um, so for me, I, I realized that we had a huge gap here. There was this incredible beauty. There is this incredible value. There is this in incredible legacy that we have as Caribbean people. And so few of us know how, know what it looks like, have been exposed to it, have been immersed in it, have been able to even work on solutions. It's just completely out of sight, out of mind. And I wanted to change that. And as you had mentioned before, Monster is a volcanic island. So when um, I was in secondary school, just about to graduate secondary school, our volcano erupted. We had about 11,000 people. We lost about half of that population through relocation. And um, I went to the UK to study and I was like, I became a volcano refugee. But when I came back to Montserrat, it was really a big passion of mine to, um, to be part of the island's redevelopment and to be able to provide for our next generation things that I knew um, I would have loved to have experienced myself and that I've seen through my own life experiences has value um, for us in terms of our sustainability, for our biodiversity conservation and for wealth generation. So this is my motivation, I think primarily, it was to really create what it is that I, I saw hugely valuable, but yet was completely lacking on our island, not invested in. So when you went to the UK after the volcano erupted, did you start diving and snorkeling there in the cold waters of the UK before you got to come back to the beautiful waters of Montserrat? <laughs> or not until you returned, did you really strap your snorkel on? Yeah, and I, I, I didn't um, necessarily start diving and snorkeling then. I did start learning to swim. I was trying to train myself to swim in the swimming pools at the gyms and being laughed at terribly by my friends. Um, because I, no matter how I tried, I couldn't get to the other end of the pool. <laughs> and, um, and also, but then I traveled a bit. I'd been to Cancun and I, I, I went, um, you know, in, in that marine environment. And I was just like, wow, this really exists. You know, this is incredible. I want to see more. I want to do more. And so when I came back home on holidays, eventually when things sort of calmed down on the island, I would spend more time with our fishermen. And in 2011, I returned to Montserrat full time. 
And I spent a huge amount of time with our fishermen. I, I would say I entered a, a sort of um, fisher's boot camp. So it was when I got back to Montserrat, I, I, I was really taken under the wings of local fishers and shown how to approach our oceans. But by this time, I could swim, but I didn't have the confidence to go deep or to snorkel out, to free dive. I, it was fishermen on Montserrat who were with me, who you know, um, introduced me to this, to the depth of the ocean, to the beauty and majesty of this space. So when you started Fish and Fins, you wanted the children at Montserrat to be able to have that experience that you wanted to have as a kid and that you had for yourself as an adult, but you have tied this active conservation component to it. So what's the kind of typical curriculum or experience a, a kid would have going through Fish and Fins? Yeah, so through Fish and Fins, the children would um, learn to swim, snorkel, um, they would then get immersed in marine biology, um, get to experience science. And we do that through collaboration with international scientists, NGOs, and any projects that are currently happening on the island. Uh, so when a child comes to Fish and Fins, most likely they have never learned to swim before. They haven't really seen the ocean. They haven't uh, seen reefs. Um, they haven't immersed themselves in that space as yet. So we split them up into different groups. So we have um, shrimps who, you know, are scared of the sea and haven't really been in much. Um, then we have um, then we have turtles, dolphin group, and then reef patrol. And by the time you get to reef patrol, um, they can um, they can swim about two hundred yards across our little bay, which is our main recreational beach and they can duck dive, they're starting to free dive, they're actually um, doing patrols to see what invasive species they have spotted, if there is marine debris, they would practice their duck diving for fun, but also for clearing debris from um, around that, that bay as well, which is a very popular used beach because of festivals and parties happening on the beach. So, um, on or near to the beach, I should say. So that's pretty much what we will do. Um, curriculum activities also involve um, safety, water safety. Um, we also collaborate with the local Red Cross and the Marine Police. So they can also learn what's happening on in terms of our um, protection of our borders, um, safety at sea, um, and emergency response as well. Uh, and then we do all sorts of fun things. So they have like, um, you know, science festivals uh, that we have run before. It's all depending on what funding we get. Because I, I wanted to really highlight, this is, not, this is a very small initiative. I started this initiative. It's a small initiative with big impact, <laughs> I should say. Because I started this initiative without a penny in my pocket, kid. I, I, didn't, I had zero budget. I didn't have any NGOs to work on. I didn't know any, anyone that could fund me. Um, I just got the fishermen, our local, between the police, the community, the parents, everyone to come together to support this project and an NGO at the time, which was Wade Institute. And um, Ayanna Johnson was the director of programming at that time, um, who w was able to just even give us equipment. I said, just give me the equipment. You don't need to give me anything else. Um, I don't need money, but we'll start this thing. So what's really precious about our curriculum is that it's so coming from the heart. This is driven by what people need, people want, and people are willing to give of their time, their expertise every Sunday or every year for the past seven, eight years um, for this programming. And it's not really because we're trying to tick a box or because, you know, it's driven because we have funding. It's because we really see a passion and uh, a, a need and the community have really supported this so incredibly much. So um, yes, there's huge amounts of need within our program for, um, for financing to be sustainable, but um, these things are all coming from, for example, we would have a, a, program, a program curricula where we um, sort of like do fishers' livelihoods. And so fishers who have been on the oceans for years, elder fishers, we would partner with them and children would be able to not only see them at sea, um, see what the catch is, but hear their stories 
um, and also understand more about how climate has been affecting our water. So they will also do some storytelling about what the coastline might have looked like before, what fish they would have caught before. Um, and we also have a, a, uh, an elder um, fisher, but he's also pescatarian. So he only eats fish and he would tell the stories of when he used to hunt turtles and when he, you know, why he stopped. And, um, and he would also show the, the children sharks, shark heads. And then so the children are able to, to really sort of integrate this learning into what they're seeing as threats and speak about the solutions with the fishers as well, which makes it incredibly, um, it's such an intimate programming. Um, and, um, and it's a really special thing to see so, uh, and, and to live. So I feel very rewarded and I'm grateful for that experience and a big up to our team, our local team and everyone who has supported us through us throughout the years. It's one of the themes that we have heard in our conversations with people working in the ocean space. I mean, one is just this incredible kind of collaboration and generosity of spirit that's out there that a lot of people who work on oceans just see that there's so much need out there and there's so much that needs to be done. So just jump in and share what you have and help others who are doing that work because we all need to be in there. You know, we all need to be in the water getting what we can done and, and swimming together. And also that there's such a value in these projects that are really grounded and rooted in the communities and community needs and community capacities and what matters to the community and connected to these larger regional and international efforts. So you mentioned that you had connected with NGOs and research scientists and other folks to help inform the work that you're doing. Could you say a little more about that? And I really wanna hear what your experience was like with experiment too. Yeah. Um, so from the beginning, you know, there's two two things that happened that um, prompted me to collaborate. Um, one of them is that very near to where I live, a child, a child nearly drowned in a pool, and the dad tried to save this child, and ended up drowning because he couldn't swim. And also the Waite Institute were going to start marine spatial planning on Montserrat. And it was then I said, no matter what happens, we're going to start this program. And I didn't know all the things about NGO politics or financing or anything else, but I wrote a two-page letter. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a two-page letter saying, <laughs> we're going to get this done, right? We, we need your help. We, we just want the equipment. Send some fins if you can. And we got that. And um, and through the work with at the, at the time, which was being spearheaded by um, Dr. Anna Johnson, we were able to collaborate immediately on having the children engage in understanding a little bit about what marine spatial planning is, what its need for it is, to see some of the equipment, experience some of the equipment, things that they've never seen before. So the children who were snorkeling were able to snorkel and see divers do um, coral um coral uh, assessment of our sur coral su surveys in our reefs um and they were able to see ex and be exposed to species that they would never have realized we had such diversity before in our waters and so that's our, our, our collaboration really started there with weight institute and then the government of Montserrat also came on board um and through that um or around the same time because of the upbringing I had as a child, I, um, I, I was very fortunate to, um, to have experienced a, a Montserrat where at the time there were so many different people from all over the world working here. And for me, I understood and appreciated diversity of culture and cultural value and exchange in our learning and in our science and in communication. Um, and in education. So then we had, I invited um, people to visit us from all over. They've come as far as Serbia and Russia and Australia uh, to join our programming. So then we had international students and I've had students from Brown University who are incredible um, in terms of the value that they would add to curriculum planning and um, inspiration for our children to realize, yeah, I can be a marine biologist. I don't necessarily have to work in the bank or the government. And um, and so it, light bulbs start going off for children. And this is still something that I'm really passionate to see continue. But um, 
And then through my own network of building people, and I would say that I've just been blessed naturally by the universe to meet incredible people um, who, you know, I think I have given so much of myself uh, without getting a bit too woo-woo here, but I think I've given so much of myself that in return, the universe, <laughs> the universe has come back to me and um, has blessed me with a network that is just so genuine and so giving and so willing to help. And as you said, within the ocean space, I find it's a small space with huge work to do, but it makes for building very great bonds, very strong bonds and friendships and support systems. Um, in circumstances which can be hard and challenging. And so that network has allowed me to see people like um, Grace Young visit Montserrat and show our children what an aquanaut does, what an ocean engineer can do, where, how you get inspired to do this. Um, you know, we have had, we've had um, situations where marine scientists from um, from organizations in the UK, like the Marine Conservation Society UK, um, support our project, hold engagement programming with our children, engaging them in turtle conservation so that they can have, have a voice in what policies were actually created for that. Um, so our, our reach in terms of collaborations and not only but collaborations, but also how do those collaborations impact our island, impact our policies, impact fisheries management is a really integral part. So I mentioned the uh, Marine Conservation Society, which uh, who I met last year, or the year before, actually two years ago. And um, it was Dr. Peter Richardson, who um, I connected to, and Amdeet Sangara, which is the UK Overseas Territories, um, you know, uh, a coordinator in our region. And through these gentlemen, um, we, we spoke a little bit about collaborating with Fish and Fins. And, um, and then I really have to give a real huge big up to them and thank you because they also saw in me a willingness to be part of create more solutions, to be more impactful, to be able to spread my wings a little bit more and get, more, get a bit more deeper involved, not only for myself and my future, but also for my community. And through that, it gave rise to a fellowship um, with the Marine Conservation Society and uh, University of Exeter and the Center of Ecology and Conservation, where I'm now um, finishing my master's. And we also have in that project, um, it's given birth to what I'm calling the next phase of my evolution of work, which is around, around um, research on low cost systems that can um, support the monitoring and understanding of what sharks and rays are in our waters and also where they're at, what the diversity is at, and really focusing on having um, low impact and low cost um, equipment. So we'll be using um, baited remote underwater video systems. Um, I'm also using and testing and experimenting with Macanu, which is a new low cost um, deep sea sensor um, that can actually reach to the depth of about 1500 meters uh, in collaboration with the Ocean uh, Discovery League. And I am also going to be using low cost analysis systems in the uh, in environmental DNA. This is all being um, done via the experiment.com platform. And I also need to give a big thank you to them because it's allowing people like myself on very tiny islands in very challenging resource spaces to um, very low resource spaces to be able to create solutions that not only my region needs and what my island needs, but that our world really needs. So um, th in that platform, I was able to crowdfund my funding um, and get the support from experiment.com. So I'd like to say a big thank you to um, Jenny Chow, Dr. Jenny Chow, and also to um, Katie Croft Bell and um, Mr. Lang, the team behind experiment.com. Yeah, experiment.com is an amazing new space, well, relatively new space out there for not just ocean science, but all different kinds of science research projects where scientists help vet and support projects that be on there. But, you know, 
these are relatively, as you said, these are relatively low lift projects to crowdfund. I mean, a, a Kickstarter platform for a new technology thing might be asking for $2 million, but on experiment.org, you can make research happen for 15 grand, 20 grand, and really powerful transformational research and research that people have a hard time getting that kind of money for. I think that's an, an overlooked space in a lot of this ocean work is that sometimes it's weirdly hard to get 20 grand and easier to get 200 right like people come in with big pockets and they're like i don't even want to do a small project that seems like a lot of overhead but what you're talking about a lot of the projects that you've done and that have really fueled your research have been like you said just give me a bunch of snorkels just help me raise 20 grand to do this research or 30 grand to do this research and it's not that of course more investment in this space isn't valuable but that we need to have more of these ways to get people what they need and what what you need isn't always a giant new you know institution it's 30 grand for your research yes exactly um it's not only getting people what they need, Kate, it's also, I would say, the urgency behind what we need is now, it's yesterday, it's 30 years ago. Um, and I'm seeing and living that every day. Um, and so if it means that by being able to raise funds, 15, 20 grand, we're able to start a project now that can contribute to global solutions, then it's something that we must do and take. And it allows so many more people to get involved, to be inspired, to be um, engaged, to, to ask questions of their political representatives. And these decisions that are being made now in regards to um, how our, our marine space is managed uh, or how we're going to respond to some of the threats of climate change, uh, how we're going to respond to new blue, eco blue economy um, innovations. Are we going to say yes, no to mining and deep sea mining and things like this? Then it's, it's really, there's a, there's a real urgency. And I think I live my life with a great detail, deal of urgency. So I'm, I'm, yes, it would be great right now if someone said, I'll, I'll give you every year 250,000 US dollars and that will sort all my problems out with fish and fins. But, but um, while we wait for that, if I had not started this, thousands of children would not have had the experience of seeing what the ocean was like to have had the experience of seeing our um, coral reef, our, our turtles, our, uh, to learn to swim, to be safe at sea, to be comfortable, to start to think, I can be a marine biologist, I can, I can be an ocean engineer, I can, I can be, uh, um, you know, I can start to work on communications and photography and videography. And this is what's happening. This is what I'm seeing. Um, this is the effect of programming like this on, on very little to no money. And it is extremely stressful. It's not easy to make, make magic out of nothing sometimes. Because, you know, I also have a 10-year-old son, which I haven't said. I am a parent, a single parent. Um, but at the same time, I love my island. I, um, I want to see the best for our future, our children, the best opportunities, and that the biodiversity that we do have is that we, we um, protect and that we are able to also invest in rewilding what we can. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the importance of the urgency and that it is a, it is a, a great and collaborative space that we get to work in. And also we all needed to start this work 30 years ago. So the most we can do is to start now. We can start where we are with what we have, with as much as we have to get this work going, to get this work moving forward. Because as you said, the decisions are happening now, decisions about where to mine and where to preserve and where to protect, they're happening this year, next year, in the next three to five years, so many decisions. And so there is no reason to wait. We could invest and take action now. And I'm glad you're, you're taking advantage of as many opportunities as we in the universe can offer you to get that action underway and, and grow this yeah. next generation of people who also want to act and engage in the ocean. 
Thank are there you. any other things you want to make sure we talk about today or, or kind of suggestions for people who might be trying to figure out their own role in acting on this sense of urgency and taking a lead in building a more sustainable ocean future? Yeah, I just, um, if nothing else, I think, you know, I think that there is so much work to be done um, in this space. There is there are so many opportunities that are exciting, um, that are rewarding, um, that are so creative. And some of them are scientific, some of them are artistic. Um, but I would like to say that I would like my story to be an inspiration for this because when I returned to Montserrat, I would like to say that I worked for the government of Montserrat as a um, events coordinator. Um, and it was through my relationship with the fishers I realized that this work needs to be done. And I took it upon myself to say, you know, we're either going to wait for the government of Montserrat to do it or for international organizations to do it, or we're going to start to do things ourselves. And as a community, as a community of people in this, on, on our islands, in our world, in our towns and villages, in our cities, we all have a responsibility, I think, to, um, to make an impact. It's rewarding um, and it is, um, for me, it's so purposeful. Uh, I, and really and truly, if I can do it, anyone can. <laughs> and I, I have no regrets. I have, no, I have no regrets. Um, I am so much more marketable. I am so much more, um, you know, useful to my community, useful to my friends, useful to my family. And um, in the end, if you're worried about money, the money comes, you know, um, it will come back in one way or the other. <laughs> Um, and sometimes even, even your relationships and your networks are worth so much more than, than, than the money um, in terms of our contribution to this, to this planet and the necessity. Um, but there are, a lot, there are a lot of people banking on this. There, there are so many children now, th thousands of children now to Fish and Fins alone who want to see what the next step is. They want to, they want to get involved in the solutions. They want to collect the data. They, they would be so excited to be able to see this impacted in our curriculum. The Caribbean, for example, are um, renewing curriculums now across the region. And so this is a time now to get climate education, blue economy education, science in, in our curriculums in ways that we have never seen before. Um, so whatever your skill and your passion and, and, and such like is, um, now is the time i i think and i am hoping that that story and uh you know my willingness to take that risk and me saying that yes yeah, it's, it's worth it even though it's pretty crazy sometimes it feels <laughs> it's um it's certainly worth it and i'm, I'm just hoping that uh, more people will be inspired to be part of the solutions that we need now thank you so much Vita. thank you for your work and thank you for joining us to talk about it today we appreciate everyone watching and we look forward to catching you on the next Better World podcast.